Kira, thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? Okay, I know they're recording it somehow, so I have to make sure that everyone can hear. Well, I'm Sue, in case you couldn't figure out who's who. This is Rhonda here. Um, we wanted to find out a little bit about you guys, because we don't know anything about you. Um, the first question is, how many of you um, have practiced clinically before taking on this role? Anybody here practices nursing or, okay, great. And then just trying to get a feel of the type of clinical research that you're doing, does, how many of you, car some type of cardiac assessment is involved in the clinical research that you're doing? Okay, so quite a few. And of you that that's the case, how many are getting baseline EKGs on your participants in your program? Okay, great. That's super. So um, for some of you, it might be the first time you've seen some of this stuff and um, we get cardiac anatomy and physiology and EKG, but for others it may be a um, more simple approach and hopefully just bear with us and, you know, there'll be some little pearls in there for you guys as well, okay? Um, and let me go over the what we're going to cover today. So first we're going to cover embryology, and I promise it won't be too painful. When I first said I wanted to cover that first, it was like, what? What are you, crazy? We don't have time for embryology. But it's a quick little introduction to embryology. Um, we'll do cardiac anatomy, cardiac physiology. We'll talk a little bit about vital signs. I know certainly in our clinic, our clinical coordinators, uh, Miranda, who's here, raise your hand, Miranda, who works in our <laughs> clinic. Um, she does a lot of this baseline assessment, taking vital signs, um, making sure patients get EKGs and things like that. So we thought it was important to kind of go over that. And then we'll do some EKG basics. Um, on the EKG part, which I'm going to teach you at the end, I normally teach that class over eight hours. Um, so trying to condense it into like, you know, basically I might have maybe 40 minutes, 45 minutes to teach that part. It's really going to be a 30,000 foot look. And then I'm happy to share my slides. If anybody wants more in-depth look, I'm happy to send you the eight-hour lecture. It's pretty um, self-explanatory um, you know, when you go through it, so it's not too difficult. Great. All right. Let's talk about cardiac embryology. So why do I care about teaching everyone I talk to about cardiac embryology? And I think the main reason is because at the end of the day, we all take for granted that the heart looks like the heart. And in the field I work in, the heart can be backwards, forwards, upside down, missing parts. And you wonder, how could that ever happen? Well, if you understand the embryology, then you understand how, th how it actually is amazing how things actually turn out to be okay. Um, and that you wonder why it doesn't turn out to be backwards and forwards most of the time. So I like people to just have a little bit basic understanding of that. So the first thing you should know, at 17 days of gestation, oh, look at that, that's terrible, the heart-forming cells appear, okay? It's 17 days. How many people know they're pregnant at 17 days? Nobody, right? So it's amazing, those things are starting to happen already. Somewhere between 17 and, and 23 days gestation, you get this thing that's called the primitive tube. Um, and this will actually end up being your heart. This part up here, what's called the arterial trunk, this will become your aorta and your pulmonary artery. This, called the bulbous cortis, is actually the part where the pulmonary artery and aorta actually come from at the heart. This will actually become your ventricles, those bottom two chambers. And this will become your atria. And then this last part down here, the sinus venosus, will be the part of the heart where your pulmonary veins come in and the uh, superior and inferior vena cava comes in. And for those that don't know those terms, Rhonda's going to explain that a little bit more. But the point is, is that the heart starts up as a tube like this, okay? And then it has, the tube has to go undergo some changes. But at 23 days gestation, we can already detect the cells already starting to beat. So that's like pretty cool. And then this um, absolutely amazing transformation happens, right? So the heart's the tube, and then the tube has got to turn and flip on itself. And if it turns and flips the wrong way, you can end up with severe and complex congenital heart disease. So it has to turn, it has to flip, and it has to fold upon itself to actually get the heart to form the way we see them the heart normally be, okay? Somewhere around 27 days, 
the heart starts to look like this. It's done all that kind of flipping and flopping and turning. And then it looks like this somewhere about 37 days gestation. And then what's really interesting, how many people have heard the term, oh, the kid was born with a hole in their heart? Have you heard that term before? What's really amazing is people think somehow there's a hole, right, that forms when in fact the heart, this part here, is actually Swiss cheese when it's first being formed. So it's not that they got a hole, it's just that one of the Swiss cheese holes didn't completely cover up when the heart was being formed. And that's why little kids who have holes, um, tissue can c continues to grow for a period of time. So those holes can actually magically go away because the heart's actually still being formed even after the child's born. So this septum kind of comes up here, as you can see, and then the septum are these walls that come down from the top. And then lo and behold, at 12 weeks gestation, the heart is fully formed. So a couple things to think about. Okay, the first is the complexity of this whole turning and flipping stuff, right, that's happening. That's one thing, getting all that straight, right, making sure that everything turns the right way. Now remember, in case you don't know, and this I'm wearing my congenital heart hat, that congenital heart disease is the most common birth defect that there is. It affects about one in a hundred kids. And you can see why. One thing goes wrong in that process. But the other thing to think about is that how many women even know that they're pregnant by 12 weeks gestation, right? So I don't know. I was out having a few margaritas before <laughs> I knew. You know, God forbid, I don't know what other people were doing early in pregnancy, right? But so you're maybe not having the best lifestyle when the heart's undergoing the most intricate part of development, taking medications maybe that could be harmful to the, um, to the heart to the baby, taking, um, maybe you're a diabetic um, and not having great glucose control during this really important time. And all those things have been shown to impact the heart. So my message from you, for you, is one, um, don't take it for granted that every heart has four chambers and, you know, four valves, because that's not always the case. And just keep in mind that anything can go wrong in that, those first 12 weeks, okay? For the rest of the time moving forward, we're going to talk about normal anatomy. But at least now you've had some introduction of how the heart's been formed and what can potentially go wrong to have patients not have normal hearts. So what's the birth date based on average? What's the percentage? It's one in a hundred. Okay. Yeah, is, is the statistics in the United States. Okay. All right. I'm going to turn it over to my <laughs> colleague. And I get the straightforward stuff. She's much smarter than I am. Am I mic'd up? Can you hear me? Fine. Um, so I get the more straightforward stuff, although I don't think the heart is always so straightforward. When I was in PA training, I actually went as a neuroscience. I thought for sure that's what I wanted to do. And I got so turned on by cardiology, so um, I hope you can hear the passion from both of us, how much we love this. So this is the cardiac anatomy. Your heart, as most people, when you put your heart, or your hand over your heart, really isn't here. It really should be here. Um, the heart sits in the middle of the chest. It's surrounded by the lungs. And we're going to go into the, the anatomy of the heart with the aortic arch and, as Sue said, from the tube and how these um, arteries come off. So this is the heart. Now, when I was in training, the, the way I thought about it, and Sue could teach this completely different, but I think of the heart as two pumping sides, two sides. I think the right side and the left side, because they pump and have very different um, things that happen. So as Sue said from the tube that you saw, this is the inferior vena cava. Inferior vena cava brings up unoxygenated blood from your lower limbs. The superior vena cava is draining the unoxygenated blood from your head and your um, shoulder area. So it comes in, so we're just going to go through this cycle. So unoxygenated blood comes in to the right atrium. Both of these coil up and dump into the right atrium. Then it meets your first valve, which is the tricuspid valve. Then it goes into the right ventricle, where it is then pumped through the pulmonary valve into the lungs where it picks up oxygen, and that in itself is pretty cool, that you have these molecules that just attach this hemoglobin. So 
This is the only artery actually in your butt body that carries unoxygenated blood. Arteries carry oxygenated blood. So pulmonary artery is the only artery in your blood that's carrying unoxygenated blood. I think that's pretty cool. But I always forgot it on my test, so <laughs> never forget that. Then it comes back through the pulmonary veins, so it's bringing oxygenated blood to the left side of the heart. comes into the left atrium, goes through the mitral valve, and we'll show you a different slice of the heart, um, how these valves look looking down onto the heart. goes through the mitral valve, down to the left ventricle, out through the aortic valve, to the aorta, and to the rest of the body. Now, what do you see that's pretty different about this structure? about the right side and the left side. Can anyone see something that's really obvious? Mm -hmm. The right side and the left side got empty. So the size, it, it does look fuller, but the thing to really take away on this is the left ventricle. Can you see the mass of this muscle? And that's because this left ventricle, this doesn't need to be as strong and as heavy. It pumps blood into the lungs, which are right here. But the left side has to get this pressure all the way up to the head, to the arms, and to the rest of the body. So you'll see things, and we won't have time to get into a lot of this today. If we could talk about heart sounds and murmurs and how cool that is, it's all made from these valves opening and closing. So a lot is happening in this um, that is really for hypertensive patients that they're always beating into a really high pressured system when the aorta and other arteries are really constricted, you'll see that this muscle, it's like any other muscle, if you use it a lot, it starts to really hypertrophy and get thick. So there's a lot of things you can tell by echo just looking at this. What is the flow? What are the pressures? Are the valves opening and closing? Are the valves going backwards? How does this muscle look? So there's a lot to take just in this picture. The heart is also surrounded by a pericardium. And this is a fibrous layer that has a small amount of fluid inside that helps shock absorb the heart. It keeps the heart in one area because if you didn't have this pericardium that has a ligament that attaches up here, if you lay back, your heart would fall back if you went forward. And my, actually, my first paper that I published was in, um, I called my mom and I said, Mom, I'm finally a cover girl. And she said, what? And I said, I made the cover of the North Carolina Medical <laughs> Journal. It's my first publication of a guy that had all these palpitations and weird feelings of his heart. And um, we ended up, he had a congenitally absent pericardium. And the reason we started to question it is when we were cathing him and trying to get the catheters into the arteries, the heart was just moving around. So we started asking more questions. And it's, and the guy was in his 60s, so had lived his whole life, but was having these weird, so the pericardium is an interesting structure. So this is the heart, if you're taking the heart, which sits right here, and you take the heart and you cut it this way, and you're looking down into the heart. So these are your four valves. Um, you have the tricuspid, and let me get oriented here. So you have your tricuspid here, but do you see the leaflets, how these, now this is what opens, and closes, open, so this is what, this is what makes the heart sounds um, that we call S1, S2, that you see this pretty frequently in your physical exams, that they have a normal S1 or a normal S2. And that is these valves opening and closing. Sometimes you'll hear a split S2. And that can be from breathing, there's a lot of physiologic things. You can see, um, you'll see S4s. When the atria may have a little bit more pressure, a little bit bigger, it can be a normal, usually is a normal finding. But then you can see around the heart these coronary arteries that we'll get into and show very briefly how the coronary arteries branch out onto the heart. So again, just to, this is just a summary. We have four chambers. We have blood coming into the right atrium, tricuspid, up through the pulmonary, out to the lungs, back in, and out to the heart, I mean out to the body. So the two cycles that are important through this, you always hear, is diastole and systole. And God, there's something I really wanted to say on the diastole and systole that I've forgotten here. But um, so these are the blood pressures. When you see systolic and diastolic blood pressure, and this is what's happening. So in diastole, the heart is filling. The coronary arteries are filling. 
and then in systole, everything is squeezing and ejecting out. And you guys know the term ejection fraction, EF. Um, you'll see that a lot when you're getting um, your, um, from your medical records, is that something you need to know. But an ejection fraction is really a measurement of how much of the blood is ejected out of the left ventricle with each pump. And you would think that 100% would be great, but a normal ejection fraction is, is around 50%. So if you're ejecting about 50% of that blood volume out, that is a good and normal ejection fraction. And when you start to drop, is something we want to start watching and looking at with heart failure. So this is your aortic arch that we just have the aortic valve here, but the important thing I wanted to show you is your coronary arteries that then go out and wrap around the heart are right here at the base of the arch, and then your aortic arch, and you have all this to your head and to your arms. Now the coronary artery, um, this is an area that I, I worked in the cath lab for a few years, and this is an area that um, is pretty exciting that you can take a cath and look at what's going on in the structure of the heart. So you have the right coronary artery that generally feeds the right side and the inferior portion of the heart. You have your left main that branches into what goes into the front of the heart and the main muscle, the left ventricle, so the left anterior descending artery, and then the circumflex that wraps around the back of the heart. And have you guys heard of the term widowmaker when people have heart attacks, that they have had a widowmaker heart attack? So this is where um, when you take a, a cath and you're looking, you shoot dye into these, and you're looking for stenotic lesions or areas that may be occluded. And the widowmaker is what happens in the left main. And that's because if you get a blood clot in the left main that branches to two main very big parts of the heart, many people don't survive that. So um, we want to try and find left mains early, but then you have, um, again, we wouldn't have time to talk about the infarction and where that happens, but it's pretty cool that you can read an EKG, which Sue will talk about later. You can look at an EKG. And if they're having an MI, many times you'll be able to see that, oh, this is most likely a uh, heart attack happening on the right side of the heart or in the front of the heart, just by an EKG. So this is, uh, we're going to go through some arteries and veins that go through the whole body, but just so, to remind you, this heart comes down, you have a large aorta here. This is showing an aortic aneurysm, so this is a weakening, and you can have these anywhere in the body, but an abdominal aortic aneurysm is not a good thing. This is a big, big artery supplying, so supplying a large amount of blood to the body and lower legs. And if you find these, if we find these incidentally, or patients rarely have symptoms for this, but if you find this, this is something you really want to watch and measure over time, because when they get to be a certain size is when you need to intervene and, and have surgery. And then this is from the kidneys on down. It, this depicts the artery and the veins match that, so whatever goes down has to come back up. Now this is really where a lot of exciting things happen. So you have your arteries that branch into your arterioles, and then they go into the capillaries, and this is where the diffusion of your oxygenated and unoxygenated blood goes. Then it's picked up by the venules, then the veins, and then back to the body. Oh, that's not a very good picture. That didn't turn out very well. Um, the, the important thing on this is to realize that the arteries and veins are both muscles. They have smooth muscles. They have an inner lining. They have smooth muscle on the outside. But one important thing about veins is that they have valves, because if you didn't have the valves with these, the blood going back up to the heart, if the valves weren't working, your blood would just, right, it just stay down. So the valves kind of keep that blood from going back. And that's a big distinction between arteries and veins. Oh, okay, thanks. So for those that go on to do any clinical training, these are the arteries that you will be learning and dissecting in your cadaver, but you can see how intricate the body is and pretty amazing that it, it can do this. But this is the artery, again, looking at the lumen, the smooth muscle, and this next picture. So this shows a normal lumen, a size, and smooth muscle around it. You can see that some, when they get dilated, and constricted, 
so you have a lot of constriction when you have hypertension. And, but many drugs can cause this to happen. So um, people who have high blood pressure, you want to give them drugs that help dilate these arteries and open them up. So uh, fight or flight syndrome. Uh, when you get scared, you really vasodilate in some areas to, because that's an evolutionary trend to get you going, to give blood to the muscles to run. Um, and then this is uh, a depiction of atherosclerosis. So when you start getting plaques from um, many reasons that can cause this, this is when we were talking with the coronary arteries, the blockages that occur that start getting stenotic and block these, and this is when a heart attack happens, or when you don't get good blood supply to other areas of the body and get ischemia. So this is another depiction, sorry, of just the veins. That other one I didn't want to include. But um, again, this is all mediated by skeletal muscle contraction to get back up to the heart. So we're almost done with the anatomy and physiology. But these uh, are pressures within the heart, again, that will, because of the left ventricle pumping out to the body, the, it, this just depicts what the pressures are within the different areas of the atria and then the ventricle. So you wouldn't need very high pressures in the right atria and the right ventricle to pump into the lungs, but you would definitely need higher pressures on the left side to get that blood out to the body. And when we do catheterizations, we're looking at this to help us diagnose, and Sue sees this all the time in the adult, I mean in the pediatric population, trying to see if these hearts are flipped, how are these pressures measuring, or there are some other things you need to start worrying about with um, with progression of their, their problems. And then this is just a nice circulation um, picture that, again, depicts the right and the left side for me. I think of the, uh, this is actually, the right side does look a lot bigger in this. But the blue, the um, unoxygenated, and then how it goes and fills to the right side. But it's just a nice depiction of that. So we're going to talk briefly about vital signs, just to, to update every, who takes vital signs in here? on a regular basis. All right, well, I'll go through this very quickly. Um, there's, there's really four areas that you need to know, blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, and temperature, and when people are outside the norms of that. And then a fifth one is oxygen saturation, especially in the population that Sue and I would see clinically. So your systolic blood pressure is the measure of that pressure at the end of systole, when the heart is finished contracting. And diastolic blood pressure is what it is at the end when the heart is in full relaxation and that ventricle is filling. Normal blood pressures, I won't go through this, but um, normal is 120 over 80. We start, uh, I won't speak to the pediatric population, but the adults, we start to be defined as hypertensive when we're 140 over 90 and start to watch that blood pressure. And you can't be diagnosed with hypertension until you've had two consecutive high blood pressure readings at two separate visits. So even if you had one and you waited 10 minutes and it's still high, that would not, you'd have to wait for another visit to be diagnosed with hypertension. There's many ways to take blood pressure, just so you're familiar with these. There's, um, if you can say this word, you win some prize here, I don't know. Sphygmomanometers, so there's different types. All of you have seen them in clinics when you've had your blood pressure taken. This is an anaerobe, and anaerobe just is a gauge, but you've seen the automatic. And do you remember the columns with the mercury that you could see just bouncing? So you don't see those much anymore. But to, to have an appropriate blood pressure, it's important for you guys when you go to clinic. If you're hurrying, you can't find a parking space, and you're running to your clinic visit, and then they take your blood pressure, it's a little high, you might want to wait. You really should have the patient sit and wait for five minutes before you take that blood pressure. Um, the cuff size is really important. If you have a cuff that is too small on a larger person, you're going to get an abnormal and not um, an abnormal blood pressure reading. So you want to make sure the cuff is um, snug, fits, uh, the, the heart sounds, and for blood pressure, it's the very, and you open that gauge very, very slowly for those that learn to take blood pressure, and you listen very closely, and your, di your systolic top number is the very first heart sound you hear, even if it waits a few, and then you hear more. It's not the regularity, it's the very first heart sound and the very last heart sound. So many places you can take these um, pulses uh, throughout the body, but 
another important thing is when you're examining a patient, you can put and just put your fingers on their pulse and you can tell a lot about that. What is the amplitude? Is it a strong pulse? Is it a weak pulse? Is it a regular pulse? So there's a lot when you're just feeling on your own pulse what this means. How is that um, circulation happening? And bruise is when you start to get some turbulence within that artery. So when we start to get stenotic lesions like in the carotids and they put the, the stethoscope over that, you're listening for some turbulence or some atherosclerotic um, changes that may be happening or some constriction in those areas. Um, again, this is just showing how to do it on your wrist, but you're really wanting to assess the rhythm, the rate, the amplitude, a lot you can tell. And you really should count for a full one minute, for a full 60 seconds. If it's regular and it seems pretty consistent, you can just for 15 seconds and times that by four. And when you're also looking at the medical records, you'll see many times it'll say distal pulses two over four or four over four. So when you're checking for pulses, you want to see, are they there? Are they there in every place we just showed you on the carotids all the way down to the two that you can determine in your feet? Are they there? Do they seem like a good quality? Are they completely absent? So when you'll see, they'll say pulses, femoral pulses, two over four. So it's a, it's a markedly impaired because the normal would be four. So when you start to see that in the medical record, that's what you're distinguishing is, is the, um, the quality of that pulse. And then lastly is oxygen saturation. And this is just, this is infrared lights that you put on your finger and it's measuring oxygen and de deoxygenated blood and um, oxygen sats. Anything below normal is a, in the high 90s. Um, anything below 90, you'd start to question what's going on as far as oxygen saturations. Sue gets to do the next portion, which is the hardest part. Um, and this is just the start and introduction to the electrical system of the heart. I have a heart here if people want to look and see in different areas of this. But the sinoatrial node is where the electrical conduction starts. And she'll walk you through the EKGs and how everything that we just talked about in the anatomy and physiology and then how um, the electrical system is working for those squeezings to happen. Thanks. Okay, my best on. I can see. Yeah, great. Okay, so next we'll move on to some EKGs. So I feel compelled to give you a little bit of history. So this is the physician that um, first invented the EKG, and he won a Nobel Prize for it in medicine in 1924. And the other thing, just to keep in mind, as you guys are going through medical records or you hear people talking. You know, in cardiology, we speak a whole different language, in case you haven't figured that out already. Miranda's laughing over there, especially in congenital heart disease. But you'll see, you know, people will spell it differently um, with a K or a C or say ECG or EKG. Now, I was always told one of the main reasons why we use EKG is not to be confused with EEG. I don't know, ECG, EEG, um, which is the thing that they do in the head. So here we predominantly will say EKG. And uh, it's funny, when I've given this uh, lecture in the past, people have said, well, I've never even seen what an EKG looks like. So I'm like, my first slide, this is what an EKG looks like. Um, this is considered a 12-lead EKG. And when we uh, do a 12-lead EKG, what we're really doing is we're just looking at the heart from all different angles, okay? So it's the same heart beats, but from 12 different angles, okay? And so, up here, these are the different angles that we're going to look at the heart from. Okay, these are at 12. And then down the bottom, sometimes they'll either be one or two lines. And what this is, is really more of what we call a rhythm strip. So this, you're only getting, like if you look over here, you're basically getting 12 looks at the heart, three beats. Okay, three beats in 12 different views. Okay, but down here, down the bottom, what we get is we pick one of the leads. I forgot I have beautiful animation. We pick one of the leads, lead two, which is actually the same lead that's up here in the 12 lead. But what we're doing is we're looking at it for a longer period of time. So this is better to see if people have sort of abnormal heartbeats, you know, because you only got three beats up here. But this will give you a little bit longer look, okay? But that is what would typically be what's considered a 12 lead EKG. <coughs> So let's talk about a little bit of the basics, 
Okay, so myocytes, those are the heart muscle cells, right? They are typically negatively charged at rest, okay? And then something happens to them called depolarization. And depolarization is when you have a wave of electrical energy that changes um, your negatively charged to positively charged. It can be the other way around. But anyway, depolarization, a wave of electrical energy that progresses through the heart, changing negatively charged myocytes. Remember I told you they're negatively charged at baseline to become positively charged. Okay. And when that happens, when it becomes positively charged, the myocytes actually contract, okay? And then after that, repolarization is when these myocytes return to their usual state, which is negative, okay? So, and over here, this is showing, this is the atrial depolarization. So what this is telling us is that there's a change in electrical energy of the myocytes from negative to positive, which causes the top part of the heart to contract. Then over here, the same thing happens to the ventricles as this impulse changes the myocytes from negative to positive in the ventricles. You see this on your EKG, it becomes positive. And then this is when it's going back to its normal state. So this all starts with your pacemaker of your heart. So everybody has a pacemaker, and your pacemaker is considered your sinoatrial node, better known as your SA node. And this is where it's located in the heart. It's in the right, near the right atrium towards the top near the SVC, or superior vena cava. <clears throat> and you can see here that this SA node is where this electrical impulse is going to start from. It's going to send that wave of depolarization through the atria. Okay, so looking down here, the pacemaker sending it through the atria, okay? And when that happens, it creates a bump on the EKG, okay? And we call that our P wave. So your P wave stands for atrial depolarization. And this time that this takes um, until it gets to the ventricle is called your PR interval. And we'll get into intervals in a little bit further into the talk. And if anybody, I lose anybody, let me know. I know it's a lot. Okay. The other thing that everybody has is what's called your atrioventricular node or your AV node. And I always describe this as the bus stop of the heart. So the electrical impulse starts from your pacemaker, your SA node. It travels through your atrium. It gets to your AV node. And that's kind of a bus stop before it kind of sends everybody off the bus. Okay. So the AV node is the only conducting pathway between the top part of the heart and the bottom part of the heart. There are exceptions to that rule in congenital heart disease, but for 99% of the population, that's the case. Okay, and depolarization slows at the AV node, producing a, a quick pause. And that's why I say it's the bus stop. It's almost like the electrical impulse travels to this bus stop it kind of pauses, almost waits for everybody to get on the bus, and then it charges forward, okay? And that this brief pause right here is from the, the top part of the heart conducting. There's that short little pause before the bottom part of the heart contracts. Okay. And then the next part, after the um, electrical impulse has paused at the bus stop, and then it's going to kind of discharge after that, the electrical impulse is going to travel down what's called the bundle of Hiss. Okay? So once the depolarization hits the bundle of Hiss, which is, can everybody see the bundle of Hiss is right here, it's right below the AV node. Okay? Once it hits there, it rapidly sends depolarization through to the ventricles. Okay? And these little fibers that come off of here are called your Purkinje fibers, okay? And they distribute the depolarization throughout the rest of the heart muscle, okay? So is everybody with me on that? Anybody lost? Okay. And there, I have. So you can see where that bundle of Hiss is located, and then your Purkinje fibers, okay? <coughs> 
Then depolarization of the ventriculum myocardium records as the QRS. So remember that second bump that we said. So this is this other bump. Okay, and that's called your QRS. Okay. So just to we're gonna just to refresh, just make sure everybody's with me on this. So your P wave is what? What's contracting to cause your P wave? Your atrium, right? So fires from your your pacemaker of your heart contracts the atria, okay? then pauses at the bus stop, contracts through the ventricle, okay, so this is the second part, and then it's returning to its negative state, the, the myocytes, the cells, okay? I wanted you to be aware that this first deflection right at the um, ventricular depolarization is called your Q wave. And so your Q wave is the first downward wave of the QRS complex, and then it's followed by an R wave, okay? But you should know that sometimes the Q wave is absent, okay? It's not so obvious that it's right here, but it's still right before it starts to go up, okay? So this is your Q wave, your R wave, and your S wave. The horizontal segment after your QRS is called your ST segment, okay? And that's going to be important. You'll hear that term around. Um, so again, can I take illustration? So your ST segment is here. And this is one of the areas uh, people like Rhonda who do more in acquired heart disease look to see for changes in that that might indicate someone's having a heart attack or having trouble getting blood to their heart muscle. Okay, so that's a very important part. And again, let's just review. We have our P wave, our atrial, right, uh, contraction, or QRS, which is with our ventricular contraction. The heart going back to its negative cells, going back to the negative state. And we have these intervals, which we're gonna go through in a little bit further. Sure. Yeah, you got it. So it goes through the um, pacemaker, through the atrium. It pauses at the bus stop right here, okay? And then from here, through the bundle of his and the Purkinje fibers, and then setting back to its relaxation state. Okay. <clears throat> the T wave way out here represents the final phase a repolarization. And remember, what's repolarization? It's going back, the myocytes returning to their original state, being negatively charged, okay? And again, that's part of that process or that part of the ST segment and T waves, again, tells us a lot about the heart muscle and its ability to relax and go back to its usual state. And that's some of the, that's the area we specifically look at for things like ischemia, heart attacks, and things like that. Your QT interval um, is ventricular systole, so it begins with the QRS, okay? So the QT interval begins at ventricular systole, so right here, and it goes all the way and persists to the end of the T wave, okay? And the thing to know right here, about um, the QT interval is that it's highly variable based on your heart rate. And you'll notice on one of the, um, these things here, I need my binoculars here, um, that they actually have this thing, it's called a QTC measurement, corrected, it's a corrected QT interval. And it's because the, if your heart rate's 60, Whatever you measure is whatever it is. But if your heart rate's much faster, then the QT interval changes based on the, the heart rate. Okay, so it's highly variable, so you have to do out this little equation. But the thing to know about the QT interval, the QT interval tells us a lot about the heart. And there are some people um, who have a particularly prolonged QT interval. 
And then that can be associated with sudden cardiac death. Um, there's actually something called long QT syndrome where families actually have this issue where their QT interval just happens to be longer than it should be, um, and it puts people at risk. A lot of people have a little bit longer QT interval. I'm talking about people with really prolonged. I don't want everyone here to send me their EKGs because they think it's long. Can I just interject one thing, too? Yes. In clinical trials, if you're doing pharmaceutical, especially new drugs, many, almost all of them now, will have to have EKGs because any prolongation of that QT is important. And they found that out through many new drugs that were went through clinical trials and then were then marketed, that a lot of the patients were having sudden death. And it's because they didn't follow that. So this is something, especially in new drugs, you will see quite often that they really are looking closely at that QT interval so they can help predict if there's this potentiation for sudden cardiac death. That's a great point. And that goes for drugs that are non-cardiac drugs. Mm -hmm. So there'll be drugs for, you know, reflux disease or other, you know, cancer therapies, any different type from psychiatric drugs often are associated with prolongation of the QT interval. So that is something that, you know, you want to be mindful of. And as a research coordinator, it's not enough to say, well, the physician I work with or the APP I work with, they measure it, it's fine. You have the potential to save somebody's life by double checking, okay? The other thing, and I can't believe I forgot to mention this in the beginning, um, when you have an EKG and it has the automatic printout of what the information is, don't believe it. Most of the time, it's wrong. So if you, it'll say on the EKG, if you look at the samples, it'll say PR interval is this, QRS interval is this, QT interval is this. A lot of times, it's incorrect. And so it is totally worth hand measuring it. Um, and again, even if someone on your team has already measured it, if it's an important variable in the study you're on, it's worth, because, you know, come up and say, hey, you know, I noticed, you know, when I measure it, the QT interval is 540. The machine said 480, should we be worried? Yeah, okay, so that's something that you can really provide value to your studies and thinking about that. So just a couple of things that you should know about the EKG paper, it's, to, it's standardized. Um, so when you look at an EKG piece of paper, each one of the big black marks, which is a little bit harder to see on here, represents one second, okay? And then when you look at the smaller box, it's probably better to look over there because it's a little bit easier. Each of the small boxes are 0.04 seconds, okay, in length. And then they're a millimeter in height. So we, when this axis, we talk about time. And this, we talk about height. So one millimeter here. And you'll see why it's important in a mil minute. And then a big box is five millimeters high. Can everybody see that? It might, sometimes it's easier to look on the, look on the EKG that's actually colored. Yeah. And you can see the boxes a little bit better there. So when you're describing, and we'll do this a little bit later, when you're describing things, you know, if, if one of your things goes all the way to this, then you, you would know that it's five millimeters high, okay? And you'll, know how, how long something is as well. Um, I just wanted to point this here to you, just back to the idea of the 12 leads. Um, you have limb leads on your 12 lead. So these are called your limb leads. I'm not sure it's all that important for you to know, but I really put this more so you could see where the leads actually go. But these are, if you considered your limb leads, one, two, three, ABR, ABL, and ABF. Okay. And then um, your <coughs> chest leads, are V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. So those are the 12 leads that you'll see on the EKG. And you can see where the chest leads go. Good. Sometimes people do a rhythm strip, yeah. If you're doing any kind of drug trial or anything like that, it'll be a 12 lead EKG. Yeah. You may get a, you know, if there's an abnormal rhythm and you want to, you know, look at a longer thing, they might do a rhythm strip, but typically it's a 12 lead. Um, and maybe can you look at Holter? I've heard about it. I have no idea. Sure. A Holter is another way of looking at the heartbeat, okay? So an EKG only looks at 
one little split second in time, right? It's those three beats and 12 different things. The rhythm strip down the bottom, maybe you're getting, you know, 10 seconds worth, okay? The next step from that, if you want to look at the heartbeat for a longer period of time, now remember, and we'll talk a little bit about this, when you look at a 12 lead, it gives you a lot of information. When you look at a rhythm strip, all it really tells you is just a few things, okay? Um, but you get 10 seconds or so on the regular 12 lead. The next step would be um, a real rhythm strip, which is usually at least 30 seconds, sometimes longer. And then say somebody's complaining of abnormal heartbeats and you don't catch it in 30 seconds, they say, well, it only happens you know, four or five times a day, then you can do what's called a halter. And a halter is basically a longer term rhythm strip. So patients actually, there's a couple different ways. They wear a box with three leads um, that is constantly measuring their uh, heart rate. And it, when they take it off 24 hours later, we load it into machine and can see their heart rate for that period of time. That's one. The other thing is called a ZIO. That's what we use now, ZIO. And that's actually a patch that glues onto the skin that they wear up to two weeks. That would be the next thing. And then there's something called a loop recorder. And a loop recorder is something people can wear up to a month. And it's constantly recording their heart rate, but it, um, it only saves it. It's not recording. It's, it doesn't actually record it until you push a button, okay? So say you feel a palpitation and you push the button, it will capture on the box anything that happened, however you program it, a minute or 30 seconds before and then a minute after the event so that we can have that. So those are kind of your, your tools that you would have to look at someone's abnormal heartbeats, okay? And then the far end of the spectrum is we actually have implantable recorders um, that people can have for years. Okay, um, and then just showing you where the standard limb placement is. So this is where your standard chest leads are. The V1 is a little bit on the right side, V2, and then down out all the way to the apex of the heart. And this is where your limb leads go. One of the, um, so in, when you look at the EKG, those things, they'll be labeled. It'll say V1, and that you'll know where to stick them. Um, there is one neutral line, so AVR, AVL, and then the foot, okay, the right left foot, so you know where they go. Okay. And I don't know that you really need to know this, but I just wanted to highlight for you that um, the way the EKG captures is when the electrical impulse is traveling towards that electrode electrode, then it will be positive, okay? So if you picture, this is your pacemaker, your heart. My heart's sitting here. My heart is sitting here. I trigger the heart, the electrical impulse, and it travels this way, right? Because remember I showed you it goes down through the ventricles. If I have an EKG electrode here, 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 as this electrical impulse goes towards those electrodes, it's positively reflected on the EKG. If it was moving away from the electrode, then it would be negatively. So positive means it goes up this way, negative is it when it goes down this way. So as you can see, remember V6 I told you is way out here. As the electrical impulse travels out to there, it goes from being negative to more positive. And then some people will continue to be really positive out to V6, but usually they'll start to get a little bit negative. Okay, less of an, so V4, which is right here, that electrical impulse is traveling directly to that electrode. So that's why that's so positive there, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? So you should normally see that. If you see it the other way around, this is the trick. If you see it's positive and going negatively, then they either have congenital heart disease or you got the leads on backwards. <laughs> So it's a, it's a quick check so you know whether you did it correctly. <clears throat> so when we look at an EKG, when I look at it, and you know, again, this is an eight hour course. I can't teach you everything in this short period of time, but I did want you to have an idea of when we look at these 12 leads, there are things we think about. The first thing I always have, always do it in a, a systematic approach. I look at the rate, I look at the rhythm, I look at the axis, I look at the intervals, 
including looking for block. I look for hypertrophy or thickening of the heart muscle, and then I look for heart attack. Now, heart attack's always lowest on my list because I don't do heart attacks, but uh, it might be higher on hers. <laughs> okay. So the rate, when we look at the rate, a normal heart rate is usually about 60 to 100 beats per minute, okay? Um, so anything less than 60, you'll read on the notes, it'll say bradycardia, and anything greater than 100, it will say tachycardia. So tachycardia fast, bradycardia slow. You should know that the heart muscle is capable of kind of firing a heartbeat from many different locations in the heart. So just because you, if your SA node doesn't work, if your own pacemaker of your heart doesn't work, believe it or not, there's backups. Our hearts are pretty remarkable. Um, and depending on where those back backups come from, um, we'll have varying heart rates with them, some slower than others. But you should just know that there are uh, foci throughout the entire heart that are capable of pacing when your own pacemaker doesn't work. Now you should say, well, then why do people need pacemakers? Well, we can get into that later, but basically they're capable of pacing but may not pace you at a heart rate that's sort of good for you and keep you feeling well. And then there's other times when, remember I told you that that AV node is the only communication between the top and the bottom part of the heart? If you don't have that, then even if other things can focus, other can pace your heart, you can't get the heartbeat down to the bottom. So that, that's another instance where people might need a pacemaker. Okay, so your R wave to your R wave is called one cardiac cycle, okay? So this is your ventricle contracting, your ventricle contracting, your ventricle contracting. So from here to here is one cardiac cycle. And you have a couple options to actually measure how fast the heart rate is when you look at a 12 lead EKG. For us that do this all the time and we just want to get a quick estimate of it, we do this thing where we count down, okay? So we find a, one of these QRSs that is on a dark line, and then we count, we go 300, 150, 175. We know the heart rate's just a little over 75. So this is how you count. You count 300, 150, 175, 60, 50. And you can do that to determine the heart rate. That's a quick and dirty way that we all kind of do that. Okay, people follow me on that? It's just you just got to memorize the, that. The other options are, um, sorry, the, <laughs> option one is actually to measure it with a, um, either calipers or um, something like this that's here. Um, so if you look on, this one here has on the side, everybody see that? That's here. You can, you can get like an EKG ruler. And then you would just lay this up against your EKG, which we can practice with doing that on the EKGs that we have. Um, it has a little arrow of what you put that on the black, a QRS that's on the black line, and then you can see what the heart rate is using that. Okay? Again, the machines are pretty good at telling you the actual heart rate unless somebody's rhythm is irregular. Um, but I still don't usually believe the machines. The next thing you want to know um, is the rhythm. And is the rhythm regular or irregular? Okay. And the first thing to look for is, is there a P wave before every QRS? So if you look down the bottom here, um, you can see that there's a P wave before each of these QRSs. And if we had calipers, which we don't, you could take your calipers and you could put them like this, and then you'd go like this and say, yep, they're all the same, looks like the same rate throughout, so then you would be able to say that their rhythm is regular. You should know, because I get this all the time, that especially in children or in people with um, sleep apnea, they will have a lot of heart rate variability with their breathing. So you'll see somebody where the heart rate speeds up and slows down, speeds up and slows down. And that's what we call, um, help me out here, sinus arrhythmia. Um, and it's just a normal finding that people have and it's just, you see it more in kids. So it's heart rate variability with breathing. So again, it will help you if you look for the P waves before each one. 
Ron just told me I'm not allowed to talk about Axis because Axis gets really complicated. So I'm just going to tell, I couldn't not tell you that we look at Axis. So one of the things that we do is we look at the EKG and we can tell by which of the views that we're looking at are positive and negative how the heart sits in the chest and how, or actually really how the electrical impulse travels through the chest. And it can tell us a lot about how the heart sits there and how thick it is. Um, as an example, typically the axis will be here. If someone's heart gets sort of thick and swollen and kind of tips more this way, then the electrical impulse might be more that way. And it tells me something just looking at the EKG. You don't need to know. It's just I want you to know that the 12 lead serves more than just seeing um, the abnormal heart rhythms. This is probably one of the most important things that you get from a 12 lead EKG is knowing the axis of the heart and how that electrical impulse travels. OK, I want to talk about intervals. The first interval is our PR interval, which is right here. Okay. And just a refresher, our P wave, right, is the depolarization through the atrium, right? That electrical impulse tra traveling through the atrium. The pause at our bus stop, okay? The two of those together make up what's called the PR interval. And the PR interval is usually less than uh, 200 milliseconds. I remember I showed you that slide of how to measure that time of how many boxes that is. Um, you can say 200 milliseconds or 0 0.20 seconds. That's the same thing, right? Um, or five small boxes, okay? Because those small boxes were what, 0.04 each, right? So that helps you there. Okay. The next interval that we measure is the uh, cure RS uh, duration. And it's from the beginning of that Q wave to the end of the S wave. Normally, it's 120 milliseconds or 0 0.12 seconds. I usually talk in the first language, milliseconds. Or less than three small boxes. Okay. And you'll get a chance to practice measuring some of these on your EKGs that you have there. The QT interval, which we talked about before, is the time it takes the ventricles um, to complete the cardiac cycle to beat and to recover. It's highly variable based on rate. And remember, I told you that the prolonged QT wave be associated with um, sudden cardiac death. So when you're measuring your QT interval, um, you'll notice on the chart, you measure it, and then you have to look correct for it by the heart rate. So you'll see that little square on your card, um, and that would be called your QTC, which is corrected QT interval, which means I've adjusted for the heart rate. Nobody ever just displays a QT interval. You always display it as the corrected um, QT. And I just wanted to tell you, um, again, it's a lot of information to cover, but I think there's terminologies that you're going to hear, so I wanted you to be aware of what they are. So first degree AV block, um, very common even in the general population. It doesn't mean anything horrific for the most part for most people. But what it means is that PR interval is longer than it should be. Okay, So we call that um, first degree AV block. And that's really when there's uh, the conduction through that bus stop, the bus stop waits a little bit longer than it should. Okay, and remember again, how, remember how many boxes I said? So it's longer than five boxes. Okay, then it's prolonged. Second degree um, AV block. So this is when you're um, having more difficulty getting the electrical system to travel through the heart. So there's second degree. And there's two types of second degree. There's something called uh, uh, Mobitz type 1, which is also, we all just usually say Winky Bach. And I'll just show you what it is, just you don't have to necessarily know this, but just because it's kind of a fun, cool thing. Not if you have it, though. Um, you can see this is the PR interval. You can see how that bus stop is kind of short. And then if you look at the next one, it's a little bit longer. And then you look at the next one, it's really long. And you look at the next one, it doesn't actually have a QRS. And that's called Winky Bach. And you'll see it, and then it starts over again. Okay? 
where um, Mobitz type 2 is that basically you have periods of time where you don't have a QRF. Okay. And then complete heart block, which is the most concerning and buys you a pacemaker, is when the atria is doing its thing and the ventricle is doing its thing and they don't talk to each other. And there's actually an awesome video, if you guys have never seen it, um, on YouTube that is this guy imitating what the different heart rhythms look like. And it's really funny, especially when he gets to third degree um, heart block. Okay. So I just wanted you to hear about them, not necessarily, and you know, they're here for your, uh, you'll have the slides, you can go back and look at them if you want. But um, these are issues with the conduction system, and there's many reasons why people have that. They can have that because um, they've had a heart attack and they have scar tissue in the heart, and that issue, that area, the electrical impulse doesn't travel very well through. I see it a lot because we cut the heart <laughs> where, you know, the electrical impulse needed to travel through. Um, and then there's just um, some people have underlying heart issues um, that can cause it. Aging can cause it um, to be more difficult. But there's a lot of different things like, you know, lupus or other type of illnesses that you might see that can cause some of these things. And those pa patients very well might be in some of your trials. So you might see this. Um, thinking about the third uh, degree heavy block and the need for a pacemaker, I just wanted to show you that um, this is what a pacemaker looks like, a typical one implanted in the heart. And the EKGs um, of these patients will have these spikes. So this person it has an atrial pacing spike and a ventricular pacing spike. Um, so sometimes you can send the electrical impulse via an artificial pacemaker to the top part of the heart and it will travel down fine because everything else works. But sometimes both systems, both sides don't work. So you need both to be kicked in. But I just wanted you to see if you saw an EKG and you saw these spikes sticking up, um, that would be why. It's because somebody has a pacemaker. The other things that we look for in the heart are hypertrophy. Um, a hypertrophy is just thickening of the heart muscle. So this is a normal left ventricle. And this is what I refer affectionately to the filet mignon left ventricle. Uh, it's actually a terrible illness to have, which is uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where you have this, for unexplained reasons, have this thickening of the heart muscle that can be um, hereditary. And when we look at the EKG, um, normally when you look at it, these things don't all touch each other. Anytime you see <laughs> four, five, and six touching each other, the heart's too thick. <laughs> a good sort of a simple way. Um, we actually have, and on your tool there, it will tell you if it's this high and this one and this low and this one, then it would equal hypertrophy. Um, but that is another thing. The point is that when we look at our 12 lead EKG, this is another thing that we're looking for. And that you can't really get that information from a, a rhythm strip. You really need that sort of global look at the electrical system to be able to tell that. And the interesting thing, let me just interject about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. When you have your sports physical for your kids, this is one of the things they're screening for because this is what you hear all the sports athletes that die from because they're very prone to sudden cardiac death. So they have an arrhythmia because their muscles are so hypertrophied that they have these arrhythmias. And this is what you hear like the basketball players that die on mm -hmm. the floor. So this is an interest and an easy screening tool, right? Another thing you just look at a and you're going to question why is this voltage so high on here. So this is what you're for. Yeah, and that's a great point. So in our world of, you know, young people and heart issues, um, almost all of the sudden cardiac deaths in young people, like on the football field, are either this or one other anomaly that we see in congenital heart disease. Um, so it's um, unfortunately... Yeah, so what happens is you have so much heart muscle. Remember, what is your coronary's job is to supply oxygenated blood to the heart muscle so the heart can work well. Well, if you have so much muscle, it's very hard for the heart to get all the blood it needs to that heart muscle. And then so you have heart parts of the heart muscle that aren't getting blood flow. And when they don't get blood flow, they don't like it. And remember I told you there's all foci throughout the heart that are capable of firing a heartbeat. Well, you can get a heartbeat firing from down in the ventricle, and it can be a life threat. Um, so unfortunately, uh, people don't have symptoms with this until um, they're very far progressed into the disease. Um, and 
you know, it's, it's tough. Without this type of um, physical exam and EKG, it's, even a physical exam can be completely normal. So it can be. One more question. What prompts to have a screening for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in young athletes? So there's actually a proposal to screen all athletes for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So the idea is now that they get a good physical exam, and if you do a good physical exam, you should be able to tell whether somebody has this. But there are actually, there's been many people pushing for EKG screening for all athletes. You would not play professional sports, and I'm pretty sure at the college level now without no. getting an EKG. Um, yeah. And there's, this is specifically what they're looking for. But luckily for, if you're not in a college level, that's a strong thing for screening. Many, yeah. many, some high schools will do it, um, and it depends on the clinic. The oh. clinics may be routine for them to get an EKG before the students embark. On, um, it depends on the clinic. But another thing, this tends to run in families. Yeah. So you'll ask people, have you had any relative or family member that's ever died uh, suddenly of an unknown cause? And that would, so those are questions that you would routinely ask in a clinic to prompt you to think back. And then that would be the, the pediatrician would be the one that would do that. Right, right. Yeah. But, but she's right. You don't, it, physical exam may be totally normal. Right, exactly. Yeah, and I think your question was, what happens if you're not an athlete? Well, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah, the you know the risk of sudden cardiac death is predominantly with exertion, um, so that's why they focus on that group so much. But you're right. I mean, you could ask for universal screening for everyone, but, but last it's still year, pretty rare. I worked with school districts here um, that were doing the screening, and they um, had uh, funding mm -hmm. from the state, and they screened. Ten of these local high schools for this. They had the kids came out. They had a big event, and this was part of it. But it's bringing awareness to this and, and asking and thinking about it. So some people, I mean, this is getting a lot of attention, and unfortunately, it gets a lot of attention when someone dies suddenly, yeah. and it's very hard to bring them back when they have this rhythm and they're. You've got people on the floor with defibrillators. It's very hard to bring them back. So did you have any success with that event? Did you have any trials? Yeah, they did. They actually did. Yeah, we worked with the wellness coordinator here for many of the big public schools. It was in the public schools. I think that's, you bring up a really good point. I wear my health policy hat. If you look at, you know, the cost, it's not cost effective to screen because the, you know, the prevalence of it's so low. But on the other hand, if you say one child should not die of this because of the cost of screen, right? So there's this, you know, that's the, it's the moral, ethical, cost dilemma that, you know, people are saying, well, you know, so what, there's going to be 10 kids in the country that die each year of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you're going to spend, you know, $100 million to screen every, you know, so there is, there's a definite debate out there. I think the cardiology community thinks it's pretty inexpensive to get an EKG. Um, there are, there's actually cardiologists, um, there's one out where I live where he does a sports clearance package for $150 and you get, you bring your kid in, you get an exam, an EKG, an echocardiogram and you're all set. And you pay cash. They don't take insurance. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. all, but all Stanford, um, all Stanford athletes get screened here. There's Dr. Perlberger who's one of the candidates. Do they get EKGs or echoes too? Do you know? Uh, I know they get EKGs. I don't know about echoes. But echoes is the cardiac ultrasound. Yeah. Psychologically, it's very hard. <laughs> yeah. How young is the, I mean, how much is, like, how far back in time do you usually start screening somebody? Well, if this family history, we screen them from the time they're babies. And we screen, if it's negative, you do every five years or so. Yeah. I'm sorry, one more question. How is something like this kind of, how can it change over time? So if you're screening as a kid and then you continue to exercise up into your 40s and 50s, can it change? Typically, we start to see it in adolescence. Yeah, that's when you typically start to develop symptoms for it. Not you symptoms, not but find it for the results because they're not athletes or weren't trained for it. Or um, sometimes these people will um, present; they'll have some palpitations, or they may have more fatigue because they're just not effectively pumping the blood out. Um, and we could get into you know 
different kinds of heart failure, but that's one of them is that they get their, because this, this ventricle is so encroached upon, so in a normal ventricle you have a large volume that's pumped out, but in this one it gets so encroached upon, so their ejection fraction, remember we, I don't mean to confuse no, you, but you remember when we talked about ejecting 50%, these people will eject 60, 70, 80, they'll eject a lot, but it's a smaller volume, so in the new they'll start presenting with symptoms of feeling fatigued, maybe some palpitations, and that's how you may find it later. The yeah, yeah. You, you, uh, you need a 12 lead EKG to do a proper assessment. The other part is a lot of these kids actually have a normal EKG too. No, but So it wouldn't come and go, that thickness would be there. Yeah. But there are some, you know, where some people have like a subtle finding of it, but then have significant when we look by ultrasound. But usually there's enough on an EKG to say you should do the next test. The other thing I wanted to mention before everyone here freaks when they get an EKG and someone says, oh, you have hypertrophy on your EKG. Um, there are many causes of hypertrophy on your EKG. And in fact, just being an athlete, um, the heart muscle gets a little bit thickened and people have more hypertrophy on it. Um, again, the, for the athletes, it's really just a screening test to say, do you need the next then test after that? But it doesn't necessarily, just because you have that doesn't mean you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There are many, many, many causes of having um, these high voltages on your heart. So that are very normal. That's a yeah. very good point. <laughs> Otherwise, I try to avoid all the phone calls. <laughs> um, the other thing we look for, um, obviously, not I should say last but not least, um, <laughs> is a heart attack, a myocardial infarction. So it's when a part of the heart muscle doesn't get blood to it. Um, and there's, uh, there's what you call ischemia, when it's just not getting enough blood, but then the heart muscle can come back to actually where the heart muscle dies. Um, and we look for changes along that ST segment that we talked about. Um, and this is, uh, this is an example of how you can see elevation uh, suggesting that somebody might be having a heart attack. So uh, the next one to transition in is just to talk about rhythms. Now rhythms are actually better to look at on a rhythm strip. So remember the 12 lead only really shows you three beats and 12 different angles, right? But if you want to see abnormal heartbeats, sometimes you need kind of a longer period of time to look at them. And I put these on here more just to, so you've heard the terms, not to make sure that you've memorized everything, but just so you've heard it. So premature atrial beats. Again, if you go back to that uh, part where I said you, the myocytes throughout the heart have the ability to fire a heartbeat, okay? So when you see these premature atrial beats, what this tells me is that instead of the heartbeat coming from the pacemaker of the heart, it's coming from somewhere else in the atria. And how do I know it's coming from the atria is because this part, the QRS, which tells me about the ventricle, looks pretty normal, okay? Um, and so I see, remember we said you always look for P wave. I see a P wave and a QRS. I see a P wave and a QRS. I see a P wave and a QRS. I see a funny looking P wave and a QRS. And if I look, if I go here, 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 it's earlier than it should have been, right? So now I know it's a pre, that is a premature atrial beats. How many of you here think you have premature atrial beats? Anyone else? Okay, you all do. <laughs> so if we put a monitor on you for a couple days at a time, all of you have premature atrial beats. If you drink a lot of caffeine or those Red Bulls, I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest you do that. Um, you'll have a lot more of those. So it kind of irritates the electrical system and you're much more likely to have more of those. Um, I should, I'm gonna go to atrial flutter next rather than atrial fibrillation, we'll jump back up. So atrial flutter is instead of that little irritated cell in the atria firing one beat, it fires a bunch of them, okay? And depending on how fast it goes and how many of them actually go down to the ventricle, so you could have I don't want to confuse people, but one-to-one -one flutter, which every single P wave has one of these QRSs after. And if that did that, it would be, let's see, three, it'd be, or 300 beats a minute would be your heart rate. 
-hmm. And you wouldn't feel so good. Okay. So this heart rate, anyone tell me? 300, 150, 100, 75, right? So it's a little under 75 beats per minute. And we have like three or four of those P waves before the QRF. So this is three to one. Okay. So, um, but again, it's just that the top is firing like this. Some of them get through to the bottom, but the top's, the top's going 300. Your bottom's only going 75. Okay. Um, and you'll see that on EKG reports that they'll say the ventricular rate is 75. Okay. Um, doesn't mean that's what the total heart rate is because the top is going 300. And then atrial fibrillation is rather than having one little finicky thing in the top part of the heart that's firing, you got a bunch of them all firing all over the place and that's atrial fibrillation. Um, and there's many different causes of atrial fibrillation, um, but it just means that those top things are going crazy and some of them get through to the bottom and some don't. The big thing to notice is this is pretty regular, right? So atrial flutter is usually very regular. Atrial fibrillation tends to be very irregular. Okay, and you can see all this craziness where there should be P wave. This is a little bit regular for ATAD, but okay. So those are the three ones that I want you to know from the top part of the heart. There's premature atrial beats. You'll also see PACs. They call it I get APBs, which is atrial premature beats or PACs, premature atrial contractions. Again, this is that other language. Um, AFib and then A flutter. Ventricular premature beats, and this is really remarkably different looking, right? So normal beat, normal beat, crazy beat, normal beat. And whenever you see these kind of wide crazy beats, then you know it's an early beat coming from the bottom part of the heart. How many of you have VPBs? Abnormal ventricular beats. Everybody raise your hand. <laughs> so everybody has them. Um, if you put a monitor on somebody for a couple days at a time, you'll see them. You, you, some, I would say 50% of the people feel them, 50% of the people don't. So if you ever sit there and go, oh, what was that? I felt my heart beat funny. That's typically what you feel. Because the ones that come from the top part, people don't, the early beats on the top, people don't tend to feel. The early beats on the bottom, a lot of people do feel. And what they feel is not actually the beat. The heart actually pauses and resets itself. And this pause is what kind of people go, what's that? Um, and that's what that is. <laughs> You're not dying. As <laughs> long as you have a structurally normal heart. <laughs> But um, sometimes you'll get an early beat, normal beat, early beat, normal beat. Sometimes you'll get a couple abnormal beats in a row. It's not normal to have a bunch of these in a row. Typically when people feel that, it's usually from the top part of the heart. Um, but you never know for sure if it's something that persists, then they can put a, a whole selection of types of monitors on you to tell. Uh, when we see at least, so if you have two of these in a row, we call it a couplet. Um, and if you have three in a row, it's, we call it a triplet or it's really non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. So non-sustained means it's less than 30 seconds. Um, so you can see here, normal beat, normal beat, normal, abnormal, 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 abnormal. Um, so you wouldn't want to see this on yours, but it does happen. Um, the other thing to note is that see how all of these look the same? So it tells me that that abnormal beat is the same coming from that same spot each time. So sometimes you'll see that they look different each time. Okay. And then ventricular tachycardia, which I hope none of you have an EKG that looks like this, um, is very fast, abnormal rhythm coming from the bottom, and this is a potential life threat. Um. And then if you see this, then you need this. <laughs> um, this is atrial fr uh, ventricular fibrillation, so basically the heart's not really doing much of anything it's supposed to be doing except just kind of shaking. Um, and that's when somebody would need to be defibrillated. And sometimes needs to be defibrillated with ventricular tachycardia too, but it depends how they're doing and whether they're stable with it or not. So anyway, that's the end of the eight hour lecture on EKGs <laughs> in an express version. So thanks so much for your attention and we can
um, work a little bit on the, the EKGs that you have, and Rhonda will run that with you. certainly want them to be in close enough proximity to capture the electrical voltage and amplitude, but it's, e it's very simple um, because if you go through, they'll tell you how to count like your risk notches and looking at V2 or V4, when, when you're putting it, you'll look at these rib notches down here and, and you know, we didn't get into exactly where that placement is, but you wouldn't want the ones that go down here to go up here because as we said, that electrical It'll definitely change the EKG. Yeah. Um, Based on where you put it. But, it. but if you're talking, you know, this much, that's not going to change. If you're talking about this much. Like the amp, the, the amplitude of it depends how far off you are from where the you're supposed to be. <laughs> less amplitude. So if you had them down on the belly, right. your amplitude would be very small. That's the way we cheat and do that in little babies that can't hold their arms and legs still. But the way to do it correctly would be to do it in the arms. But you can get it. It's a, ch it's a way to cheat. You can do it that way. It's not, um, it will change the waveforms a little bit, but not enough to, it's okay. Yeah, it's just not, you're not getting good contact. So, so the machines are finicky. You know, sometimes try a new sticker try to adjust where it is. It's just, it thinks it's wandering around the room rather than on the, <laughs> on the patient. And you can do that with rings. You have no idea where and that's really hard. Yeah, shaving those spots. You got to do it. Spots easier because the adhesive on the electro won't knock. It won't, it's in contact with hair. Well, it's not in contact with the skin, so you won't make it lose your touch. Does someone have a heart attack? Does any, if someone had a heart attack or passed away and they came to the hospital, can they feel like they had an episode, something happened? How long? You can answer that, Miss. It's a great MI. question. Um, it depends on a lot of things, um, so it's hard to answer that simply. But um, as long as it's in there, it's still happening. The the stenotic lesion is tight enough to where you're not getting good blood supply. You should still see that EKG change. But you will see it in the hospital that people will have chest pain when you do an EKG, and you'll see this T-wave inversion, and then you give them isoglycerin. And within minutes, you'll see that start to upright itself. But if, if it's really happening and an infarct is happening, you'll see that. You'll see that for hours. And then you'll be kept in permanent. And even long-term, after yeah. you've had, you get permanent changes on your EKG. Oh, yeah. So there's actually, um, and I didn't put the slide in here, but there's, there, what's called the transition from the sort of the acute phase of an MI. So the ischemia, which could be reversible, but then to the necrosis where the muscle dies and it's not. So you see those changes. And then there's sort of how they recover over time and then what they look like forever. So people who've had, a, if I had a heart attack 10 years ago and I didn't go to the doctors, they do an EKG, they might, they'll still be able to see that at one point I did. Any other questions? If it keeps you standing, it's not too low. <laughs> yeah, no, you're not going to see anything as far as a morphology change on an EKG. No. Oh, is that, uh, you're asking yeah. specifically yeah. for EKG? Yeah, that's, I get my husband who, I shouldn't, for recording, I was like, who is a hypochondriac? Hypochondriac. <laughs> He's like, is my blood pressure too low? And I'm like, honey, you're standing, it's not too low. <laughs> Thank you. 
so um, I was having a lot of fun teaching heart sounds if we had the time to do that. But just, it, 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 you know, when you're examining a patient, it's the full picture, right? It's taking this and then listening and taking that. But the heart sounds, you're going to be listening for a regular, normal S1 and S2. And then you're listening for noises in between those sounds where maybe murmurs are happening. But when you're listening to the heart, just like we do in an instant looking at an EKG, you're listening while you're listening to that heart. You're, you're saying to yourself, okay, those are the normal, is there noises between there? Is there murmurs? Is it regular? It's the first thing you think about. Is it regular? Is it normal, regular beat? Okay, we're not having any arrhythmias. And I think that was your question, right? Like if you hear, can you, you n can't necessarily tell what, the irregular rhythm is. Sometimes if you listen and it's irregularly irregular, then you're like, oh, this must be atrial fibrillation because that's the one that does that. But if you're hearing early beats, you, you wouldn't necessarily know if it's coming from the top or the bottom or where. You'd have to get the EKG then to look. Mm -hmm. Is the drum beat Yes. Well, thank you so much.